my task is to bring you to the world of medicine. And I'd like to start off with uh, an email I received uh, not long ago. This is one of the uh, emails I receive uh, basically daily. So I'm going to read it for you. So dear Dr. Piumelli, it says, I have read about your work on marijuana. I'm the father of a three-year-old girl diagnosed with autism. I would walk through fire to get her a cure. Can marijuana help my girl? I gotta say, I've read this to people so many times. Every time I read it, it curdles my blood. As a father, as a scientist, I gotta ask myself, what is this man asking for me? For me as a scientist. What can I do to answer this question and the question that so many other people are asking? Can cannabis help? In what can it help? As a scientist, I have to put these questions in a different way. I have to ask what medical conditions, if any, can really benefit from cannabis? What are the risks associated with cannabis? Because there is no such a thing as a benefit without a risk. And what can cannabis teach us that may lead, in general, to better therapies? And as we approach these questions, I'd like to make very, very clear that emotions are wonderful, but we need evidence. We need data. We need evidence-based answers. Opinions are great for debates, but when it comes to decisions, I think they have to be tempered by facts. So I'm gonna share with you some facts. And being a professor, I brought my slides and uh, I'll walk you through them. I promise there will be many chemical structures. <laughs> Not. So how does cannabis work? Many of you know this. Let me just remind you. It contains chemicals one of them is quite famous, it's called THC, another one is called CBD, and the structure of one of these compounds is shown. So one of them is shown here, THC. So how does it work? Well, when people use the compound, use the drug, it enters their brains and it encounters in their brains a protein that sits on the cell, on the surface of the brain cells. These are called neurons, and these particular proteins are recognized THC in cannabis, just like a key is recognized by a lock, these proteins are called the cannabinoid receptors. And we have a ton of cannabinoid receptors in the brain, and they are spread throughout the brain. They are present in specific regions of the brain, but also they are very, very, very abundant. And what do they do when they are activated by THC? Well, what they do is something similar to what they do when they are activated, but they're our own compounds, what I, ca I call the brain's own cannabis. Our brain makes chemicals that have chemical structures different from those of THC, but similar enough that they will recognize the cannabinoid receptor just like THC does. These compounds are endogenous cannabinoids, so we call them endocannabinoids, just to sound smart. <laughs> what do they do? They do a lot of different things, and they're really important things. They control feeding, they control emotion, they control pain, memory, as well as pleasure. These are the functions of a molecule our body makes. And we experience it every day. As we live our lives, these molecules are regulating these different functions of our body. We should be aware of that because it's very important to understand what then cannabis does to this endogenous system. What does it do? Well, by activating the cannabinoid receptors in the brain, THC will produce the effects that I'm sure you're quite familiar with because your friends told me about them. It stimulates appetite, it relieves anxiety, it alleviates pain, it impairs short-term memory, and also it can be addictive. 
These are the effects of THC that pharmacologists like me, that's my job, I'm a pharmacologist, pharmacologists like me have over the last 30 years characterized. But how can we use these effects from a therapeutic perspective? Which ones of these effects, which we have studied in the mouse, in the rat, in the monkey, and also in people, can actually turn into a real therapy? And this is what I'm gonna try to briefly go over with you in the next couple of minutes. The first one, the one I wanna really stress, and I wish this is, if you have to only take one thing out of my boring lecture tonight, is this, chronic pain. One in 10 Americans experiences, at least once in their life, excruciating pain that comes from damaged nerve or from inflammation. Chronic pain is profoundly regulated by the endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system is actually one of the main regulators of pain along with the other system. You have heard before Congressman Ronald Bucker mentioned the opiate system. The two systems are, go hand in hand. And we have, I'm gonna show you some data. We have data showing very, very clearly that comparing a placebo to a cannabis, the cannabis will perform better than the placebo in alleviating pain intensity in humans. In fact, the Academy of Science, the National Academy of Science, in a panel I was honored to be a member of, uh, last uh, January concluded, as you can see written here in the slide, that there is conclusive and substantial evidence that cannabis is effective as a treatment of chronic pain in adults. This is a statement that comes straight out of the conclusion of a study that involved nine months of work looking at 24,000 papers. And let me tell you, being a member of that committee, I, I, it was not exactly a, a walk in the, in the woods. Chronic pain, another one, very, very important, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Um, how many of us tonight have family or themselves who have gone through the ordeal of having chemotherapy or experiencing one of their family with chemotherapy? Well, THC in cannabis, but also CBD, the other component of cannabis, they act in regions of the brain that stimulate appetite and reduce nausea. So this is an effect I like to stress that is opposite to what the opiates do, opposite. So the opiates cause nausea, the cannabinoids decrease it. And again, the National Academy of Science has concluded that cannabis is useful as a treatment for, it's not potentially useful, it's useful as a treatment for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Finally, the third indication so in, in which National Academy was extremely clear is spasticity in multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is accompanied, as you well know, by these muscle spasms that are extremely, extremely painful, and THC acts to alleviate those spasms. And again, this is the third and actually last indication that the National Academy has recognized as being uh, definitive and uh, having substantial uh, uh, support from evidence. Now, the National Academy also studied other indications, and these are indications that are often allowed by states in which medicinal cannabis is legal as indications in which cannabis can be prescribed. However, the data do not support necessarily that. They do not support that and don't necessarily support the opposite. The data are not there yet. We do, for example, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, cancers, autism, post-traumatic stress disorder. These are all diseases in which there is a lot of anecdotal evidence, but anecdotes do not, no matter how exciting they can be, they not amount to proof, to evidence that we can use. So we need, what do we need? Well, we need a lot of work to establish efficacies in these other indications. We need to establish, basing, basing ourselves on the anecdotes we have now, ask the question, are these anecdotes valid for you, 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 or are just valid for the one person that has told us about it? That's an important point. So let's look at the other side of the coin. Let's look at the risks. The first risk I wanna put out there for all of you, and please do bring that home, and please do talk to your families about it, 
is using, expecting, and nursing mothers. I strongly recommend being very, very careful if you're expecting, you think you're expecting, or if you're, if you're uh, uh, nursing, to use cannabis. And the reason for that is that THC crosses the barrier that defends the fetus from the, uh, from the blood, crosses it, and it accumulates in the fetus. And so does in the milk. So the, the, the infant will be exposed to THC, to CBD, and we do not know what that, what that could bring about as consequences, which is simply don't know. While we don't know, I say better safe than sorry, just don't do it. Similarly, teenagers, the brain of a teenager is extremely changing every day. Don't we all know that, who are parents? <laughs> and obviously we want, we want to be sure that they are, this growth is not interfered with by anything, not alcohol, not tobacco, not marijuana either. And especially the frequent use of marijuana we have to be careful about. For a reason I would love to be able to entertain you with, with a very boring two hour long lecture, but I won't. There are a couple of other things that one needs to be careful about. People who suffer from schizophrenia, people who have heart conditions should be careful with, the, with cannabis. So this is why this is medical cannabis, because it's going to be, it has to be handled by professionals, by medical professionals. And an additional work is needed to understand and fully assess those risks. So I'm going to conclude by asking, by saying a couple of things that I think we can get done in the next five years, not in the next 50 years, but really in the next five years. And I would love to be able to be part of that. I think we say that we can say the last word on cannabis effectiveness in a series of clinical indications for which we still have no evidence of efficacy. For example, Parkinson or anxiety. We can assess the risk associated with medicinal cannabis use, which are probably going to be different from those associated with, uh, with the recreational cannabis use. And I think we need to le leverage, we need to use our new knowledge to create better cannabinoid-based medicines to go beyond even cannabis and help the patients in many other ways. Now, in conclusion, I want to go back to the, uh, uh, to the email I received from this anonymous person. Can we help his girl? Y yes, I think we can, not right now. But to be able to answer that question appropriately, we need a societal commitment to reduce regulatory hurdles and to support research. And in particular, I want to say to deschedule or reschedule cannabis from schedule one to a lower schedule to make possible the research that we need. Thank you very much. Dr. Piamelli, uh, you read an email that pretty much took the air out of the room. Everybody just gasped at getting such an email. So, and I know in your position it's, you don't want to give advice, but let's say one of us received that question, perhaps we have a relative that is dying of cancer or is going through chemotherapy and they ask us, what do you know, should I, should I try cannabis or should I try some more conventional medicine? What would your advice be? I say go to your doctor, uh, speak to her or him, and explain uh, to your doctor that uh, you believe that this could be uh, useful for you. Uh, what I try to do when people ask me that question, I also try to share with them um, some data. So for example, if it's a cancer patient suffering from great pain, then I send these, these folks um, uh, scientific papers, scientific papers, you know, through the email, and I said, bring this with you. When you see your physician, this is the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's not the Journal of Psychedelic Studies. It's something very, very serious, and you have to take it seriously. I, that's all I can do as a basic scientist. Got it. Thank you. Uh, in your, in your slideshow, you mentioned under risk factor, addiction. Um, there's a lot of talk that I'm seeing, this, this kind of nascent movement, plant over pills, and we probably have a number of people here that have read about cannabis or are thinking maybe I might try some. Can you expand on addiction and cannabis? 
Let me first start off by uh, stating what is addiction in the medical dictionary. So a behavior that we pursue despite our knowledge that is hurting us, that's an addictive behavior. So addiction is not dependence. You can become dependent on a number of different things. And as you became dependent, you can also regain f full control you know, in a process that is complex, but it can be done. Addiction is different. Addiction is also a disease of the brain. It's not a problem of will. It's a disease. It's a chronic disease of the brain. Now, does cannabis cause addiction? When we think addiction about addiction in the terms I just shared with you, we always think, the first thing we think about is opiates, crack cocaine, alcohol. Those are things that are devastating forms of addiction that um, we are familiar from, a, even from a filmic standpoint. We remember the movies, right? You know, and how people in the movies with addiction behave. And we think, well, cannabis doesn't do that. And it's true. Cannabis does not do that. The type of addiction that cannabis causes, and now I think all specialists agree, uh, we really know ax to grind, that cannabis does cause addiction. The, the type of, of addiction that cannabis causes is of a different type. Uh, it's milder, it's harder to get, but it's there. So it's say 8% of the people you use it become eventually, can become eventually addicted. 8% doesn't seem a big number if you compare it to the 45% you have with nicotine or the 35, 40% you have with uh, uh, cocaine. It seems like a small number. But if a lot of people use it, that the small number is gonna translate into a lot of people, that small percentage into a lot of people. So I think uh, we need to be cognizant of this and ask ourselves always, when we talk about medical cannabis, because that's my main, my main concern, uh, what are we comparing cannabis to? So uh, I, I spoke about chronic pain, and there is a reason for that, because it's the one condition that I believe offers the greatest uh, uh, promise for <coughs> cannabis. And of course, the big comparator there is what? The opioids. And we, I don't think it needs any introduction to anybody that the opioids, although very, very effective, are extremely addictive drugs. They're very, very addictive. And there is no question that if we compare cannabis to the opioids, the addictive properties of cannabis are much milder than those of the opioids. We know this for, f these are facts, but then there are a lot of questions. And I think we need to answer some of those questions. Let me, uh, let me point to one in particular. If we combine cannabis and opiates, what happens? That's something we need to ask because our youth are gonna do that and also our patients are gonna do that. We don't really know what happens in the long term. We know what happens in the short term. In the short term, if you combine a small dose of an opiate and a small dose of cannabis, you got a lot of pain killing effect. So that's called a synergism with potentiation in, ca in case you care. But, but the problem is in the long run, are we enhancing the possibility of getting an addiction to either drug or are we decreasing it? That's again, goes to the, my last slide, we need research on this. Hi, my name is John Stashenko and I have a question for Dr. Payamelli and Dr. Reynard. Um, I was wondering if in your research, if either one of you have found or know where we could find a list of contraindications for cannabis medicines? You're asking about contraindications to cannabis medicines? I, I tried to cover some of the, uh, of the potential risks uh, in my presentation. Certainly, um, I think it's important to uh, avoid usage in, uh, uh, during pregnancy and during uh, nursing, as well as in, in adolescence. At this point, I think it is critical that we, uh, before we make any proposal about use of cannabis products in uh, adolescent or younger, uh, younger kids, um, we assess in that condition, in those conditions, what the safety of the product is. I think that is something we, uh, we really owe uh, to the public. As far as other specific uh, uh, contraindications, um, uh, actually, um, 
medical use uh, is likely to be different from recreational use. So what we have learned from recreational use might turn out to be outdated. So that's one reason why I pointed out that at one thing that we, we do need in the future is to really specifically ask the question, medical use, say, in the end elderly, is it going to be uh, causing specific effects that we do not expect? Let me just elaborate on this a little bit. So if you, um, if you consider, for example, the use of cannabis in, in young people, uh, one thing that cannabis does do, it uh, makes you, sh um, uh, sh shortens your memory. That, that's something that, that happens uh, all the time. Now that happens in young people. Does it happen in older people, in elderly people? We don't really know because the system, the famous endocannabinoid system I, I, I bored everybody with is really uh, changing, uh, changes during life to the point that in, uh, in late adulthood and in old age, it might be actually have opposite effects that those it has during adolescence. So if this is the case, then you, we really all, all, the, all the bets are off and we don't really know what side effects could happen in, uh, you know, in a medical, uh, say, 50 or 60 or 70 year old uh, uh, subject. You see what I'm saying? A lot of research is still needed.